All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to Law and Crime and Law and Crime on Sirius XM. You are watching and listening to the live feed in the Sean Great case out of Ohio, this accused serial killer who is on trial for numerous crimes, including the murder of two women and the abduction and rape of a third. Joining me on set right now is a special analyst to help talk more about this case, Law and Crime trial analyst Bob Bianchi. Bob, it's good to see you. Great to be here with you, Jess. Good to see you. So the idea with the prosecution's rebuttal argument right now, trying to show how this is premeditated. I, I, I was surprised to see the defense coming forward and saying, well, um, you can't pinpoint exactly that he killed her during the commission of a rape or during the commission of a kidnapping, but it seemed pretty clear when you have two decomposed bodies in the basement of the house, uh, some under trash, and they seem to be restrained, and their skirt is pulled up on Stacey Hicks, that looks like the killing did occur during the commission of these other felonies. Yeah, absolutely, and the defense has got to be careful that they don't lose credibility with the jury here, because the ultimate determination in any death penalty case, Jesse, is, is from the defense point of view, is keeping the defendant alive another day, another hour, another minute. This isn't the kind of case, in my opinion, where the jury is going to come back and buy one of those arguments. So I think the defense is spending a little bit of its credibility uh, in, a, in a bad way here. Having done death penalty litigation, it's more important for them to try to spare his life than it is to try to argue these little nuances and hope that they're going to get a not guilty on the capital murder charges. I don't see it happening. Right. He is charged with multiple counts of aggravated murder, and perhaps these specific details are what lead to the aggravated nature of these crimes. We're going to go back live into the courtroom with the prosecution closing argument in the Sean Gray case out of Ohio. Well, ladies and gentlemen, there you have it. That was the prosecution's rebuttal closing argument in the Sean Great case out of Ohio. I'm Jesse Weber. This is Law and Crime, and you're also listening to Law and Crime on Sirius XM Radio. What we were presented with today, today, excuse me, was the closing arguments in the Sean Great case, this accused serial killer. This accused serial killer, a man who is on trial for the murders of two women and the abduction and rape of a third. Some really serious charges here, ladies and gentlemen, and the details could not be more horrific, particularly since these two women's decomposed bodies were found in the house where Great was living. Let's bring in long crime trial analyst Bob Bianchi. Bob, the facts of this case are extremely disturbing. Um, if he is convicted, if he's convicted by this jury and wouldn't be surprised if they find him guilty of all these charges. Where do we go next? What is the next step of this case? It's going to be what sentence the jury will impose upon him, whether or not it'll be a life without parole sentence, essentially, or a death sentence. How are the mitigating factors presented by the defense? What are the mitigating factors here? I know he has a teenage son. Is that something that can help? Jesse, I love that you asked me that question because having handled death penalty cases myself, it's kind of like the prosecutors feel a little bit of an unfair playing field. In other words, the prosecutors can only pose aggravating factors that are specifically listed in the statute. Mm -hmm. But if you look at carefully, it's based upon a United States Supreme Court decision as to mitigating factors. While they're listed by statute as well, there's always a catch all that says in any other relevant mitigating factor right so in death penalty cases that I've tried um, you get like social history whether they have children anything that can pull on the heartstrings and essentially the Supreme Court is saying look if you're gonna impose the ultimate penalty you should allow the defense to throw anything out there that they can to justify giving the guy a life sentence without parole as opposed to death penalty so yeah uh, having a child would be one of those things but I gotta let me just back up a little bit I've done murder murder is my thing since the day I got out of law That's school a statement. Yeah, murder is my thing boy oh boy uh, certain cases have the uber creep factor to them that just go above and beyond the pale of your average murder case, even death penalty case, and boy, that this is one of them. It, it certainly is. It's one that I'll have trouble forgetting, and I'm sure the jurors will ultimately have trouble forgetting. We're going to take a quick break. We'll be back in a minute. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Jesse Weber, and you're watching Law and Crime, the Law and Crime Network, and you're listening to Law and Crime on Sirius XM Radio. We're covering some of the biggest cases of the day right now, and one of the big cases that we've been following live is the Sean Great case out of Ohio, this accused serial killer, okay, who is on trial 
for the murders of two women, Elizabeth Griffith and Stacey Hicks, as well as the abduction and rape of a third unidentified woman. Now, this case is going to be in the hands of the jury. That's right, both the prosecution and the defense delivered their closing arguments, and it will be up to the jury to decide what will happen and what will they will decide for Sean Great. Remember, Mr. Great, after pleading guilty to 15 of the 23 charges in the indictment, he still faces murder charges, kidnapping charges, and robbery charges. There's a lot at stake here. What we want to play for you is the, is the closing argument. Is uh, We're going to play for you the closing argument in a little bit from the prosecution. But before we do that, let's talk a little bit more about what's on the table right now. So I'm here again with law and crime trial analyst Bob Bianchi. Bob, the, he, still on trial, he still could face some um, aggravated murder for Elizabeth Griffith, um, aggravated murder of Stacey Hicks, kidnapping of Stacey Hicks, kidnapping Elizabeth, of Elizabeth Griffith, and aggravated robbery of Stacey Hicks. So in other words... The prosecution, the defense, the prosecution is saying um, he's guilty of these crimes. But the defense, when they admitted that he pled guilty to those other charges, they're basically saying, "Look, he didn't kidnap these women, and he didn't um, uh, he didn't murder these women. They just happened to be found in his house, decomposed." I mean, what is the jury supposed to believe from the defense's argument? Okay, so we start off <clears throat> with a, a thing called the law. And the law says that you can only be convicted of capital murder if you've met certain criteria of offenses. And so what he pled guilty to were all non-capital murder offenses. Let me, let me just say that real quick. So he pled guilty to gross abuse of a corpse, burglary, tampering with evidence, rape of Jane Doe, um, he, uh, multiple ca uh, rapes of uh, the other women. So again, the question becomes, he raped them, he had his way with them, but he didn't force them to be yeah. there and he didn't kill them. Yeah, and, and you bring up actually a tactical question that I, I was asking myself. Uh, I've never seen this thing as happening with greater frequency in all the years I've done this where people are pleading guilty in the middle of the trial um, I just think that that looks really wobbly in front of a jury you're going in there saying that they're not guilty of these offenses in the opening statement you go through all the testimony and one of the reasons defense lawyers like to have a whole bunch of charges from which the jury can choose from is because lots of times juries compromise when they're in that jury room or they get confused on very complex law that's why you saw the prosecutor in his rebuttal doing a very very good job at being very detailed as to what the law is because it can get confusing and as a prosecutor what you want to make sure is that they don't find them guilty of something that's a non-capital murder offense so the tactic here from the defense side uh, I raped them I I did all these bad things to them but I didn't do this I I think uh, is difficult and again as I said before I think they lose credibility with the jury what a difficult job it'll be for the defense attorneys and what they tried to say was to separate look my client pled guilty to this but didn't plead guilty to this mm -hmm. it's tough it's tough to sit on that jury and for the at least for the defense not to be able to separate those those charges all right ladies and gentlemen what I want to do right now is I want to play some of the prosecution's closing arguments from earlier this is really when the prosecutor hammers home the a point about why this is a premeditated murder why mr. great is guilty of all of these crimes let's listen in 